with my pictures with my kids. to Milala that I have shown. I really hope my college from FPT can have a chance to From the depths of our oceans to the heights of space, there are no limits to what we can accomplish when we push past our current boundaries. There is nothing more potent than the will to learn and to share what we know. The future is happening faster than you think. Curious about new tech trends? We're here to help you stay up to date with this fast-changing world. At each live talk, we will discuss different technologies and trends with global experts from countries around the world. Ask your own questions and learn how to get the answers you want to get on the forefront of technology with Tech Innovators. Hello everyone, I am the entrance of Mila. As you can see over here, Mila is the biggest deep learning AI institute in Canada and in all over the world as well. Uh, over here we have more than 1,000 researchers with uh, more than 50 uh, top class, world class AI professors. So uh, follow me to uh, find out more about how Mila look like. You can see here
conferences. and the Bingding government to site-check a location for a possible future AI conference summer school in Kainan, Bingding. And further consultation occurred on the building of the FPT AI Lab Research Hub between Vietnam, FPT, and Mila in Kinan. FPT Software AI Residency Program recruits top young Vietnamese talents to work with world-class scientists at FPT and Mila to do research and implement AI to benefit society. Since working with Mila, the FPT AI Residency Program has contributed greatly to the development of FSoft AI Lab. In 2022, FPT Software AI Lab is one of only two Vietnamese AI research institutes that have publications at A-Star conferences. We have total 32 paper submissions, of which 10 papers were accepted at A-Star conferences. in 2023. Three, co-organize a wide variety of activities and training sessions to stay current with the latest scientific advances, research trends, and upcoming publications of AI. So, welcome everyone to the Tech Innovators. So, uh, my name is uh, Phong Nguyen. Uh, I'm the Chief AI Officer of FPT Software. And uh, I'm very happy today to be your host again. Today, we're going to discuss together uh, the topic of AI in drug discovery. As you may know, Tech Innovators is a series of events designed for people working in tech. And our event today is even more special as we are celebrating the two-year partnership between FPT and the leading AI research institute, Mila Quebec AI Institute. In the last two years of partnership, FPT Software has started a program called AI Residency, which nurtures young AI talents, and we have seen them thrive at international AI conferences such as ICML, 
new ribs. And in this episode, we are honored to welcome the top mice and special guests from Vietnam and Canada. So from Mila Quebec AI Institute, please welcome Professor Joshua Banjo, one of the world's most influential scientists. Join us from Canada. Hello, professors. Hello, Fong. From, um, also from Mila, we have Mr. F Mr. Frederick Lauren, uh, the Senior Director of Partnership. Hello, Frederick. Hello, Hello everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce to Professor Ho Tu Bao, the Director of the Data Science Laboratory at uh, VA, VIASM. Hello, Professor Bao. And from FPT thank side, you. yeah, thank you. From FPT side, please welcome Dr. Chung Zabing, the Chairman of FPT Corporation. Hello. Uh, we have Ms. Chu Thi Thanh Ha, the chairwoman of FPT Software. So Ms. Ha has uh, had a chance to have lunch with Professor Joshua Benjo before. Thank oh, you very that's much. That's great. I remember. Oh. <laughs> and um, see you all. joining us actually today, a special guest from uh, Consulate General of Canada in Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, Ms. Jasmine Wahab, the senior trade officer, also in the in the participant that uh, seeing the uh, event today online. So for the agenda today, um, Professor Joshua Benjo will share with us uh, his work and research uh, around machine learning and drug discovery. Then we will have a round of discussions uh, about AI ethics with uh, Professor Benjo, Professor Ho Tu Bao, and Dr. Chung Zabing. Uh, finally, we have a Q&A &A sessions. Um, some of the audience will be invited to uh, present some of their questions uh, to the guest speakers directly. First, uh, let's welcome Dr. Chung Zabing uh, to deliver uh, a remark congratulating the two-year anniversary of the FPT and Mila partnership. Professor Yoshua Benjo, uh, actually, uh, we are very proud with uh, what we did two years ago to sign partnership with you. For that uh, two years, not too long, and it's a huge job have uh, done, and that's amazing. And I would like to thank you. You, Professor Yoshio Benjo and Mila Institute and Frederick for support and for providing a great opportunity to Vietnamese uh, talent. What even they cannot to dream, to see it in the dream. Why I say it? Because today they can uh, join your uh, summer schools, uh, tea talk, and uh, uh, reading group uh, from Vietnam. It's amazing. Uh, in during my student, uh, only I can join with my teachers. Uh, but in his room, uh, if someone in Vietnam cannot to join, it. <laughs> that's amazing. Uh, secondly, they can uh, participate in the uh, the, uh, the tough uh, research on AI, even in the system too. Think of how the young uh, Miss of Vietnam can conduct with you research on system too. And think of uh, the, 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 the numbers of uh, research the Vietnamese conduct. And I so impressed with the numbers of paper submissions, 42. And really, we are something like one third of Vietnam publications in the A uh, and A star range. It's uh, amazing. And more than that, you uh, start. Uh, we start to lay our foundation for further uh, uh, collaborations 
uh, Frederick visit uh, Bình Định to think how we can set up the kind of AI research institute in Quy Nhơn. We love it. We want it so much. And also, the, 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 the hundreds, thousands of students can know about our co collaboration via uh, media. That's a very great uh, starting. And I do hope that in uh, coming years, we can do big uh, uh, achievers, achievements. Thank you very much for everything. Thank you. Yes, Professor Joshua and uh, Frederick, would you like to share some of your thoughts on the um, uh, partnership for the past two years? Yeah, I would like to say that uh, it is indeed impressive and uh, we are very glad uh, to have entered into this partnership. Uh, it's working and I think uh, there could be uh, even more fallouts in, in the future. And what I hope is that um, thanks to the seeds that we're planting, uh, Vietnam young people um, will enter into these uh, uh, technologies and sciences that are going to be transforming the world in the coming uh, decade. And so that's, that's, I think, quite important. I would like to add one thing. Uh, the, the achievement should be much bigger if Vietnamese talent can see you in person in Vietnam. Please come to Vietnam. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for the invitation. Yes, Frederick. Frederick, do you uh, would you join us? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Maybe I can add a, a few things. Um, so Mila was actually very impressed um, with the students that are collaborating with, with our researchers. And I have to say that uh, even myself, when I was in Vietnam, I was uh, very impressed by, uh, by the students and their, their willingness to, to, to learn. And um, I've had the opportunity to visit many countries, many of our partners. Um, but FPT is probably one of the uh, very uh, the closest relationship that we have at, at many levels, um, not only for uh, fundamental research, but also all of the trainings and, and exchange that we have together. Um, and we really hope that we can uh, continue this uh, for the next uh, three, four or five years and even uh, longer. Thank you very much. I do hope so too. And uh, thank you everyone for the wonderful remarks for the collaboration. So our partnership has evolved greatly. Together, we provided unique opportunities for uh, young Vietnamese uh, talents and uh, for AI development, not only for FPT, uh, but also for many, uh, it's an inspiration for many uh, other countries as well. I hope so. <laughs> um, and uh, at Mila, uh, the Institute set uh, the missions for um, AI for humanity, uh, social responsibility, and beneficial development of artificial intelligence. So that's why today we're going to listen to uh, one of the most advanced research uh, from Mila. Uh, so please welcome Professor Joshua Benjo um, to provide his lecture for AI uh, in drug discovery. So please, uh, Professor, you can start your yep. lecture. I will do so now. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to start by telling you why I got into this uh, area of application, uh, drug discovery. Um, it's because of the pandemic, you might have guessed. Um, I was like many scientists uh, two and a half years ago asking myself, how can I help to deal with this uh, terrible thing? And so I started reading about um, uh, biology and the epidemic and epidemiology. Um, and it turned out I had uh, some students who had some expertise in, in uh, chemistry, biology, and drugs. 
and we started thinking about how we could use machine learning in order to transform the way that drugs are discovered because typical drugs might take many years in fact uh, 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 drugs that can fight infections might take like antibiotics for example or antivirals might take 10 years and when there's a pandemic you cannot you know cannot afford collect we cannot afford to wait five or ten years uh to find solutions um so we need ways to accelerate the development uh of uh, of drugs and and machine learning ai can completely change that um that uh, that that industry and the way that things are done so i'll tell you a little bit about uh what we've been doing and why and sort of uh, some of the principles behind our work. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, the pandemic, we with the COVID pandemic is, is one thing, but as I dug deeper into these questions of infectious diseases, which give rise to pandemics, um, I realized that um, I actually, humanity is is at risk. Like Any time there could be a new pandemic, and um, uh, one problem is that currently the pharmaceutical industry is not really investing very much in these things. And, and you know, there's there's a whole like economic reason behind this, even though it's worth a lot to society. Like the the loss of economic value due to pandemics is one we just had is is huge and um, in particular in the case of uh, more generally the adaptation uh, the mutations that are happening to these uh, pathogens to these uh, viruses and and, and, uh, bacteria because we're using drugs uh, they become resistant and um, in fact there are now quite a lot of uh, bacteria that we don't have any drugs again no antibiotic uh, fortunately right now these bacteria are not too uh, to 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 vir- to virulent to to lethal but they could mutate and become uh, really really dangerous because we don't have any drug we don't know how to fight them so um, so I think there's there's a real uh, challenge for humanity to invest in technology to deal with us. Um, and as I will try to convince you, machine learning can really make a difference, reduce the cost, speed up the discovery. Um, and also the questions that are raised are at the frontier of uh, machine learning research. Uh, these are not trivial things. Um, and as I'll try to argue, solving these questions advancing these questions is going to give us very general purpose tools not just for drug discovery but for discovery period in general scientific discovery technological discovery um, um, i think could in the future be transformed by using uh, machine learning yeah so just to give you some numbers about the problem of uh, antimicrobial resistance so the fact that uh, these these bacteria or these viruses or fungus um, are mutating and becoming um, insensitive to our drugs uh, this is a problem that's slowly rising there's already 1.2 million deaths uh, per year and it's going to grow to 10 million per deaths per year if we don't do anything and the economic costs are also rising and it's projected to be on the order of 100 trillion US dollars by 2050. Now, the good news is that uh, there's been advances in biotechnology in the last few years that uh, really opened the door to machine learning. So actually, I think that one of the areas of growth, economically speaking, um, for the next decade, that may be one of the greatest area of growth is at the intersection of AI and um, and uh and biotechnology uh and uh, you know it's in the area of uh drug discovery but uh, you know health more generally but also agriculture uh fighting climate change and other environmental applications 
Um, and, and the reason we are able to uh, get a high throughput uh, generation of large data sets is because there are now these technologies that can reprogram the DNA of um, uh, organisms and we can reprogram them so they can synthesize the molecules that we want. And, and we can do that on a large scale. So we can do an experiment with 100,000 different DNA sequences that uh, ask, uh, for example, a yeast to produce a new protein, a new peptide, which is a small, small protein. And you know, each of them is going to be different and, and can be chosen by machine learning. But it's hard for a human to decide what should be those 100,000 sequences. Um, it's 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 just that, that it's, it doesn't fit with their human brain abilities. Uh, the amount of data that is generated by these experiments, the number of experiments that we can control now with with those technologies, it's impossible for a human to manage that and to absorb all that information. So we need we need machine learning, and um, and the kind of machine learning we use. Um, in, you know, involves what looks like an intractable problem that essentially consists in uh, searching and finding like a needle in a haystack. In other words, for example, the number of potential drugs is huge, like 10 to the 60, or the number of theories that are going to explain some observed experimental results is also huge. Um, so huge that even using computers, we cannot enumerate all the possibilities. So uh, what I'm going to tell you about today is that machine learning can help us to uh, represent all those possibilities, which we call uh, posterior distributions over theories or sample candidate experiments, uh, uh, just to uh, get access to generate uh, the good theories or the good uh, candidates. So, in order to understand this, I need to bring you back to high school <laughs> to understand the, the, the scientific method cycle. Um, how do we discover new things? How do we discover new theories? How do we discover new drugs? So, we start on the top left with data that we have accumulated. And we're going to be generating more data with new experiments. So there's going to be a, you know, this cycle where we analyze the data and then produce uh, new experiments, and that gives us more data and so on. So now I'm going to like, go a little bit more detail in this cycle and see where machine learning can be used. So first, given the data we have already accumulated, we can use machine learning to model that data, to, to train the, uh, for example, to predict a given a candidate drug, what, you know, what's the chance that it's going to be uh, doing the job. And at that level, there's already some really uh, difficult and exciting advances that are happening in machine learning on the side of modeling, using ideas of causal machine learning which I'll say a few words about. Now, these kinds of models uh, are not the usual kind of models that we train in machine learning, like with supervised learning, where you predict one variable given the other variables, um, because we need those models to have a sort of knowledge of their own limitations, knowledge of their own uncertainty, because there could be multiple models that are compatible with the data, uh, if you want multiple hypotheses that are compatible with the data, and we need to be able to have a handle on, on that because it's going to help us design the next experiment. So uh, how do we design the next experiment? Well, we want to choose an experiment that will teach us as much as possible, that will teach us about what are the correct theories, what are the right drugs that may work in this context. So we have a lot of uncertainty. Can we use the next experiment to reduce that uncertainty? So that's called experimental design. And here again, we can use machine learning. And I'll talk about that. And finally, 
you can use machine learning to accelerate the experiments themselves using robots. I will not talk about that, but that, that's another place where you can use machine learning. Okay, now there's an aspect of um, this question of generating candidates, like new potential drugs. Um, we would like our machine learning system to generate, of course, many candidates, but we would like these candidates to be different from each other. We need them to have enough diversity. And the reason is that the way that our experiments are typically going to be conducted, um, because we want to have high throughput, we want the experiment to be cheap, we want to generate a lot of data, it's going to be using a cheap experiment, like in vitro, you know, uh, in a test tube. So in test tubes, we can actually do huge quantities of experiments in parallel, so they are very cheap. But of course, the test tube is not the same thing as your body. So, you know, the test tube is going to give us some indication that the drug may work, but it may end up not working for all kinds of reasons when we take the drug into the body of uh, first, uh, you know, mouse, and then later into the body of a human in a clinical trial. So it's really important that the set of candidates that we generate using machine learning have a lot of diversity so that if it turns out that our in vitro, for example, uh, evaluation was incorrect and some of the candidates don't work out in animals or humans, um, we still have other candidates that are quite different. So if we had all the candidates like very similar to each other, then we take a big gamble because maybe none of them is going to work. Whereas if they are diverse, then we have a greater chance of, at the end of the day, um, having a drug that's going to work for us. So that's why diversity is important. Now, one um, is how do we choose which candidates to try? and um, I said we could train a model that, say, learns a function f that predicts how good the drug will be based on the data we have. Y, and maybe we can train a neural net to predict Y given X. The problem is the number of possible Xs, the number of possible candidates is exponentially large. I said like 10 to the 60. We cannot even try all of them in the computer. So even if we have a a neural net that predicts y given x, we cannot apply that neural net 10 to the 60 times. It's not feasible. So what could we do? Well, we could use generative models. So this is, you know, uh, one of the big advances of deep learning in the last decade, that we have neural nets that not only can make predictions, but they can imagine things. Mostly people have been using these generative models for synthesizing new images. And we've seen a lot of that. But here it's not images that we want to synthesize, it's uh, molecules. Uh, and this could be applied to any kind of object we want to experiment over. Molecules, uh, materials, uh, uh, even potentially, you know, programs. Uh, people are starting to use deep learning to generate programs, software. So uh, these generative models are quite interesting. And uh, now we have to find a way to train them so that they, they, we can use them in this active learning scientific experimentation loop. And that's what we've been doing. So this motivated our first paper on this subject that came out at the last Europe. So that's December 2021. Um, and uh, we propose these 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 uh, special uh, way of training neural nets, which we call generative flow networks, that that do exactly this: that they can um, generate, they can be trained to generate complicated objects like graphs, which represent a molecule, but any kind of data structure. 
and they can be trained to generate those compositional objects through a sequence of steps such that they will generate the objects with a probability proportional to some given reward function. So normally in reinforcement learning, we're trying to find a sequence of steps that maximize a reward function. That's the typical thing, it's optimization. But those Gflow nets, they are a bit different. Instead of maximizing, they sample with some probability. So they sample the good things with more probability. And that's important because it helps us to produce a diversity of candidates, which is what I was talking about and is in the title of the, of the paper, you see. Um, yeah, so we, we did uh, a, a lot of experiments to validate this and, and compare it with existing methods uh, for uh, generating molecular graphs, uh, Monte Carlo Markov chain methods and, and classical reinforcement learning methods. And indeed, these methods find a lot more uh, diverse set of candidate solutions. Um, in a more uh, recent paper that came out last summer at ICML, um, we extended this to include the notion of um, uncertainty I was talking about, you know, of Bayesian uncertainty that um, for some drugs, the neural net might have a lot of certainty that it's going to work or it's not going to work. And for other drugs, it might, you know, have much less certainty because there's not enough data for these types of molecules uh, that help the neural net make a confident prediction. So there are different methods that have been used in order to estimate that uncertainty. And then we can combine that information with the Gflow nets so that we can train them to generate candidates that are both uh, in expectation looking good, but also have a lot of uncertainty. So they might, you know, we might do even better than we think. So we apply this to the design of biological sequences, uh, including drugs, but also new materials. And we find indeed that they can do comparable or better than existing methods, but more importantly, they can generate a lot more diversity in the candidates through uh, uh, these active learning uh, settings. The last paper I want to talk about um, has to do with the hard question of um, how do we build a really good model um, of data that um, is never going to be overconfident and wrong. Um, and, and that is important in order to estimate that uncertainty, that Bayesian uncertainty I was talking about. So, so this paper came out last August uh, at the UAI conference. Um, and it's about using Gflow nets in order to uh, generate candidate causal graphs that explain the data. So you can think of a causal graph as a scientific theory that relates different variables and proposes you know, which variable is the cause of which variable, uh, what are the cause and effect relationship. Each cause and effect relationship becomes an edge in a graph. And so it's hard because the number of such graphs is, ex is super exponential. It grows very fast. And traditional methods would enumerate graphs, individual graphs, and, and try to find one graph that fits the data. Whereas using Gflow nets, we are able to learn a distribution over graphs. In other words, we can generate all the graphs that are compatible with the data. And that is very important in these kinds of applications of uh, drug discovery that I've been talking about. Um, yeah, so this is, this is part of a bigger question in machine learning, which up to now, <clears throat> let's say, uh, there has not been very satisfactory answers. Um, that is, how do we, uh, for example, train neural nets that not give us just one answer to a problem, 
uh, like uh, one uh, model that fits the data, but somehow can capture all of the models that capture the, the data. And it's, it's fundamentally hard because the number of such models could be exponentially large. Um, in the past, methods uh, that have been proposed uh, have not worked that great because they made very strong assumptions, mathematical assumptions. And, um, and, and, and what I'm proposing uh, this year is that we can use large neural nets, uh, modern deep learning, to represent very rich uh, Bayesian distributions. So this paper is the first step in that direction. Now, I mentioned causality before, so let me like dig a little bit more into why this is important. Um, one of the biggest challenges in machine learning now, maybe the biggest challenge, is that we have systems that are not as robust as they could be. And we know that they could be more robust because humans are more robust. So if we train the system on some data that coming from some distribution, maybe from some country or some demographic. And then we try to use the machine learning model in a different setting. Usually there's a big loss in performance. And this is called the out of distribution problem. And we would like to have good out of distribution generalization. And I and others, think that the main solution to this problem uh, comes from approaches like causal machine learning that are still in their infancy, which are able to conceive of the learning problem not as just learning one distribution, but learning a whole family of distributions corresponding to the context that may be different, different interventions by, by people, different experiments that we might do in a scientific context, different initial states, different environments. And, and so if we can learn a causal model uh, well, we can generalize to all of those distributions. And this is challenging, but uh, one of the bottlenecks is precisely that we would like to be able to capture all of the causal models that are compatible with the data and the kind of methods in, 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 in this paper allows us to do that. Um, yes, I think I will stop here and uh, take your questions. Thank you very much, Professor Joshua Benjo for a very uh, quick uh, lecture uh, for AI discovery, uh, AI for drug discovery. And uh, the audience has a lot of questions uh, for your lecture. Um, so first, uh, I would like to introduce uh, one of the uh, uh, audience who have the uh, first questions. OK. I, I receive his question now, so I uh, would like to uh, send it directly to you. Um, so can drug discovery be a possible topic for a small team with uh, limited resources? Or does this topic require a mass scale resource for experimenting and production? Well, that's a great question that I've been asking myself because uh, uh, at Mila, we have a lot of uh, machine learning resources and computers and stuff, but we don't have like biological experimental setups. And the really large scale ones are happening in industry. Um, so it depends what the contributions you want to do. If you want to do contributions to AI for drug discovery on the AI side, you can without ever doing an actual experiment because there are a lot of public data sets. So in the experiments, in the papers that I mentioned, actually, it's all using public domain data sets. So, for example, data sets that relate uh, particular molecules with their activity against bacteria. And, uh, and so there's a lot that can be done this way. Now, of course, that helps to develop better algorithms. But if you want to actually turn that into drugs, you need to do biological experiments, like real, <laughs> uh, real world experiments. And um, and for that, you need to associate with organizations that uh, do these things. 
So at Mila right now, we have, I think, at least five contracts, five partners with uh, biotechs and pharmaceutical companies. They are very interested in working with AI researchers because they understand that it's, you know, AI is going to transform their business completely in the next uh, few years. And they are willing to do these kinds of experiments. Also, what we have been doing is collaborating with um, other academics uh, in biology with expertise in drug discovery. And they have, you know, some small scale uh, setups that are sufficient to do, you know, quite a few experiments already. So, yeah, they, you know, yeah, there are ways to do that. And then the last thing I want to say is, uh, you know, I have students have started a company, a startup. They don't have a lot of money and they don't have like biological benches. So what they're doing is they're making deals with other startups that have expertise in biology and then, then that have the equipment to run these biological experiments. So, you know, even if you don't have the full thing, uh, you can associate with other people who do and, uh, and that can work. Thank you. Um, the next question is, um, what can ensure the safety of the uh, drug that designed by AI? Um, because since some of the effect of the drugs may occur after five to 10 years in the future. Yeah, no, this is a great question. Uh, well, we, we have already governmental organizations like the FDA in the US. And in many countries, we have some equivalents, for example, in Canada. Uh, and these organizations are precisely, you know, with the task of making sure that the drugs that are gonna be put on the market, they're gonna be used by doctors and patients are safe. So when, uh, before a drug can be commercialized, they have to do clinical trials and the phase one of the clinical trial is to verify that the drug is not toxic. Now you're right that, you know, these studies, they cannot take five years, you know, they might take a few months. Um, and we don't know the long-term effects. Um, but that, yeah, so that, that is a trade-off, uh, that doctors are aware of. So when they prescribe a drug, which is new, we don't yet know what the long-term effects and they might be more prudent and they might use the drugs on people who uh, otherwise might be in real trouble. And then of course, as years pass and you know, we can, uh, the, the FDA mandates doctors to give back information when there are problems. So then uh, we collect information about longer term impact. But, but yeah, it's, it's not easy because uh, you know, there's an ethical question here do we take a risk and save lives now, uh, you know, with some risk or we don't do anything? It's not obvious. Very interesting. Um, the last questions uh, from the, today, I, I picked the best three questions. So I, I know there's a lot of questions actually coming into the system, but uh, I think the next question is quite interesting. So the machine learning methods for that drug discovery are mostly aim at the deriving the novel molecular structure. Um, yes. But is there much exploration in assisting the chemists in syn um, synthesizing of these new structures? Yeah, there's also machine learning. In fact, we have a paper a couple of years ago um, to use reinforcement learning to uh, help design how to synthesize the molecule. So let's say we have the molecule, which is a sort of graph. So, you know, the chemical formula and so on. How do we construct it? So what sequence of um, uh, reactions and what chemicals, which we call reactants, should be used at each step? And, um, and it's not obvious. So, I mean, humans will do it by hand. There are chemists that, are, that have the expertise. 
but it, it, it may take a lot of trial and error. And so we can actually train machine learning to do that because there's very large databases of uh, the recipe for synthesizing uh, molecules. So it's like supervised data. And then we can use reinforcement learning to um, kind of reward the machine if it's able to uh, find a, a sequence that yields the correct answer, the correct um, uh, molecule that you're trying to generate. Um, yeah. Um, uh, let me add something uh, you didn't ask me, but uh, you may have noted in my presentation that I used um, fairly mathematical terms to talk about these new methods. So these are probabilistic methods, um, you know, talking about causality and Bayesian. These are pretty advanced topics in machine learning. And the, the most uh, important thing to keep in mind for, for this, and I think many other applications in the future of machine learning is that, yes, we will need engineers who understand those methods, but for the scientific advances, in machine learning, we'll need people who have very strong math background. So I'm saying this because I think there's a good tradition of mathematics in Vietnam. And I think it's important to cherish that. Um, it's going to give an edge to the people who have that sort of training. Thank you, professors. Um, our topic today attracts a lot of people on the live stream right now. Thousands of people are tuning to our uh, channel to uh, listen to your lecture. Um, so, and you mentioned in your answer as well, um, there are a lot of ethical concerns when we're dealing with uh, the power of AI and especially when it comes to healthcare, to drug discovery. So I would like to move to the uh, Next part of the today uh, sessions, well, we're going to have a small panel discussions uh, with uh, Professor Joshua, with Professor Ho Tu Bao, with Dr. Chung Zabing. Uh, I would like to talk about the uh, usage of AI and the AI ethics. So, um, so first, I would like to ask Professor Joshua Banjo, um, is there any other uh, ethical concerns in, uh, in AI uh, for healthcare, for drug discovery, other than the one you mentioned in your answer? Is there any big challenge, yeah, bigger no. challenge than that? Yes. <laughs> Lots. Um... Uh, maybe some of you have heard of uh, an experiment that was done by machine learning scientists uh, working on drug discovery. Um, so one of the things we can do with machine learning, I mentioned like designing the molecules to so that they will uh, bind well to the target, uh, maybe like a bacteria. Um, and also, uh, using machine learning to synthesize. But <laughs> sorry, another application is to predict the toxicity. So you you know we, we discussed earlier the question of um, whether a drug will be toxic. And normally we use this uh, predictor that we can train from data so that we avoid drug that will be toxic. However, these people have shown that we can use the same neural net that predicts toxicity. And instead of designing molecules that minimize toxicity, we can design them to maximize toxicity. In other words, design new poisons. Right? And of course, this could be used, for example, in a military setting. There, we already know some very dangerous poisons that can be used to kill people. And now if people start, I mean, if like military organizations start using AI to design new poisons that could be potentially even more lethal or easier to distribute or something, 
then that could be very dangerous for humanity. So they, they did that experiment to raise an alarm. And that's often the you know important thing to do uh, when ethical questions arise like this. We need awareness. We need people to understand the dangers so that we can you know, come up with legislation, we can come up with social norms, uh, we can come up with, uh, you know, company guidelines to uh, minimize the chances of misuse and to penalize organizations that use technology in a way that's going to hurt humans. Thank so you. that's one example. I'm sure we'll discuss more. Yes. Uh, so we can see that uh, comes with the power. Uh, so we need yes. uh, the responsibility to exactly. use. Exactly. Yes, the power of AI. So uh, Professor Hutubao, uh, I know you have been working a lot uh, for AI ethics. So uh, you have listened to uh, Professor Shua Banjo, some of the concerns regarding uh, ethical concern when we design uh, drugs and um, for uh, longer term for healthcare. So can you actually tell us more on um, what is actually AI ethics and what are the principles for AI ethics? Um, you are on mute, can you uh, unmute? Uh, yes. I also have a chance to work for many years on analyzing the medical data. I work in Japan. At Japan Institute of Science and Technology, we work with hospital and deal with the certain kind of data like uh, stomach data people gather for many years, or like uh, liver disease uh, data. And also in Vietnam, we join on uh, establishing and supporting the EMI, electronic medical records in hospital, and also work on data for drug utilization not for drug uh, discovery. But anyway, in our case, uh, we think uh, the privacy of the data to protect the data of the people is also a very important issue. It related to the responsibility of AI people because uh, we now say uh, AI is produced by people. So two things, one is uh, the people who produce the AI product and the people who use the AI. And as you ask, uh, talking about the uh, principle of uh, ethics, ethics in AI, I think um, uh, also as many people discussed, uh, there are several things people need to care, particularly it is the responsi responsibility of people. Firstly, people we will talk about the fairness in AI just mean we need to be we design so that uh, to respect the discriminatory known harm that do not uh, uh, yes and the other principle is uh, sustainability because uh, the AI product is strongly influenced on the society and on the people. So the accuracy, the security and robustness of product is as a thing to be considered. And also an important principle of ethics in AI is the accountability. That means we people who produce AI product should be able to uh, talk about the to answer the question about our product is the process of producing it and auditability of the product. As a principle is a transparency. That means everything we do should be able to reply to reply the possibility, permissibility, and as I said, discriminatory of no harm. We need to be able to explain the process of produce the product. And in short, it is on about the responsibility of people who produce the product and also uses the AI product. Yeah. It is something I think about the 
some principle of ethics in AI. Yes, thank you. Uh, I can see that uh, there are so many aspects that we have to consider when we're working on some particular topics or some particular projects and uh, some application of AI. Um, so you mentioned about uh, uh, diversity and also the um, in in your uh, talk, uh, Professor Joshua Benjo. So I know that you know um, drug. Um, has been tested and data has been collected and uh, mostly skewed to the uh, developed country. So pe people like uh, Western people usually got uh, more data uh, on their healthcare, uh, more than Asian or some underdeveloped uh, country. So is there a concern or is there a, a problem in, in bias when create, we create, uh, we use AI to create drugs, or we can use AI to improve our healthcare. But it vastly based on uh, the data we collected from the developing, uh, from the developed world. Developed world. That's true. Uh, in fact, it's not just the uh, problem of uh, uh, different ethnic groups. It's also even the gender issue. So until recently. Uh, a lot of the clinical trials uh, did not involve um, uh, women, or not enough, or and did not involve children. So we have drugs that we don't really know if you know they're going to be toxic on children, for example. It, you know, we know they're not toxic on, on adults, and uh, and then there's also an imbalance in the gender. Uh, for many drugs. So this is changing in uh, this regulation now that is trying to guarantee that we have better representation at that level. Uh, regarding the ethnic composition, this is a, this is indeed a real issue. So the reason why all of these matter is because the machine learning predictors and the drugs, um, they might work well for the demographic on which they have been trained and tested. But we don't really know if they still work well on other demographics. Um, and so I think it is important in uh, uh, different countries that uh, we make sure that the clinical trials are uh, representative. Um, one thing that I've seen happening is that uh, because clinical trials are very expensive, um, we see more and more clinical trials happening in developing countries, actually. Um, and so maybe this is a way for countries like Vietnam to uh, make sure that they will be well represented in those designs. Um, and I don't know if this is happening in Vietnam, but I know, for example, it's happening in other Asian countries. Um, but yeah, these, these, these are hard questions. From the machine learning point of view, like when you train, you can do proper tests. So even if you have only a subset of the population that maybe is, you know, uh, uh, different ethnic groups, you can make sure you evaluate the accuracy separately on each uh, on each group, so that you can check at least at some level of st statistical reliability um, that the product is robust across these groups. And even during training, there's a way to uh, rebalance the, the, the training set. So even maybe uh, if like 80% uh, of the, the data comes from one group, um, you can train so that you visit those examples less often and, uh, and, and over sample the examples from the minority groups. So there are solutions. And um, as uh, Dr. Bao was saying, um, uh, you know, what's important is transparency here so that we know what has been done in order to uh, protect the public properly and, and uh, you know, abide by those ethical principles. Right, thank you. Um, so uh, as a, one of the leading organizations in, in Vietnam, so I hope FPT can uh, start <laughs> working on some of the 
uh, problem like you just mentioned, like the data discriminations uh, for like under uh, underdeveloped country like Vietnam. So, Doctor Bing, do you have some comment on that? Uh, I would like to address uh, broader uh, things about the uh, ethic of AI uh, because that's so important. Oh, we know we should you should worry about that. Uh, humans is a very complicated nature, and you know, still war. Yeah. Every w w people w want peace, but the war now, and we see it. And therefore, uh, from a uh, uh, APT point of view, I would like more kind of uh, practical uh, actions than the. the and immediate uh, actions. I, I see uh, three things. First, I think we should think AI as a new literacy of the people. Every people should learn something from AI, from the first grade to university, because AI will impact their life and let them have education on AI and let them bring AI to their job, to their activities, their, uh, to their learnings, improve the efficiencies of what they're doing. Uh, second, I think uh, we, we really need the people live for values, AI for social good. And that kind of thing should be reflected in APT education system uh, aligned with 17 uh, United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals. And our quality system now based on that 17 goals. And uh, last point, I, I, I think the people learning through uh, practice, through, uh, through the experience. And therefore, I really would like the paying students, even pupil, they start to do the kind of social responsible uh, works. And if that should be AI for good, that's an uh, excellent point. And we try to implement that. Um, APT education today quite big. Uh, we have about 140,000 pupils and students, and that number will doubling after every two years. And if you can do this kind of things uh, in APT education system, and then that should be. <coughs> Uh, kind of uh, inclusive father is kind of way uh, to other uh, educational institutions. Okay, and your visit should be uh, raised us interest much. Please coming to Vienna. Thank you, um, thank you, Doctor Bing, for the very interesting uh, points. <laughs> so you mentioned about uh, education. Uh, is is very important part, and uh, and uh, I think education is also a very important uh, factor, especially in AI ethics. So, what is your viewpoint on that? Um, how peop how AI engineers, how AI students should learn about AI ethics? When when and uh, is a good time for them to learn? Before they start learning or after they? Finished their learning in technical. So, Professor Joshua Banjo, can you? Yeah, um, no, I completely agree um, uh, that it, it, it has to be all the way that uh, we educate our students with the right values. Um, and um, uh, one thing that is uh, kind of sad is that in computer science, the students just study computers and they have very little understanding of social questions. So they have very little understanding of uh, how society works. They have very little understanding of human psychology. Um, and uh, 
you know, of course, they cannot study sociology and psychology and political science at the same time uh, as much as they study computer science. But I think they need some healthy dose of knowledge in these fields so that later when they you know, are engineers and researchers, um, they understand better the impact of um, the products that they design or deploy. Yeah, so I completely agree. Now, uh, one thing I would add is education is super important, but there is also a political aspect in the sense that governments need to um, set the rules, you know, come up with regulation. This is starting to happen in Europe, in Canada, in the US, uh, other countries, governments are starting to draft regulation. And one reason why it is important is that you want to have a level playing field between companies. So imagine you have two companies, one that is very self-conscious and cares about uh, you know, social good, a good corporate citizen, uh, like FPT seems to be, and let's say another company that is a competitor and doesn't care about society except for making money. If we don't have the right rules, then the the um, second company is going to win over because uh, there is there is a cost to uh, being ethical. And uh, and if the cost is not the same for all the companies, um, then then we're in trouble because the the bad companies will win over eventually. So it's it's really important that also governments at some point uh, be part of uh, setting the rules so that every company you know looks at the fair um, uh, level playing field. So there should be some kind of initiative or some rewards from. Uh, the governments to encourage yes. organization to do good things. Yeah. I'm this totally topic. agree with that. Yeah, that's very important. So um, let's talk about uh, privacy. That's one of the very important uh, factors in AI ethics. Um, so uh, many countries, uh, you know, treat privacy differently um, from each other, and uh, uh, like. You just mentioned about governance as well. So some governments actually really care about privacy and some may not. So is this a cultural thing or um, is there an universal uh, motor that we should use for data privacy? So uh, maybe uh, Professor Hotubao, do you uh, want to, uh, do you, what do you think about the, the different opinion between countries uh, about data privacy? Yes, I when I work in Japan, I think uh, people protect privacy is a high priority. Uh, I want to ask uh, the doctor data of patient from Chiba Hospital. What my friend, one professor said, I can only give you my father data. I cannot the other for you to study. But in Vietnam, of course, very strictly in Vietnam, it is much easier. We even can receive uh, much data from hospital. Of course, we do some kind of identification, but uh, I, I also see clearly the protection of privacy or respect privacy in different countries are very different. So, and that's the problem in developing country like Vietnam is still not be carefully considered. Concerning to your talk, we know that uh, our country is in the period of doing digital transformation and people on way in general think that the law is very important. The, the government is on the way of building the law strategy. So anyway, law of data, but it's still, uh, it takes some time and it's still not completed. But I think yeah. uh, when it uh, finished and things should be much better controlled. And also uh, concerning uh, in education, I would like to tell you that uh, 
So far in Vietnam, uh, roughly about 10 universities already have a bachelor program on AI. So mm -hmm. I think, uh, yes, uh, is uh, uh, about 10 universities in Vietnam. Uh, and many other have a master program on AI, but only 10 has a bachelor program on AI and data science. And I think uh, uh, cost or ethics in AI should be introduced and yeah. should be completed. If uh, some still not at it in curriculum, I think it should be added to the program. And it is yeah. very important. I want to mention that here in Canada, um, there's too much emphasis on privacy for health data. I mean, it is important, but it, you need to put in the balance both the privacy and how much you can use technology to save lives or cure people. And right now, you know, it's just privacy. And so the result is there's a lot of medical data that the researchers don't have access to. Right. And I think you can find compromises mm. where, for example, the researchers, uh, not everyone can have access to the data. You need to be, you know, certified uh, and so on. And, and then we can develop new solutions, new medical treatments and so on. But right now it's, it's very difficult. Right, I completely agree. My professor in Japan, he work here also say in Japan they are too strict to privacy of medical data, and that's also a barrier to use the yeah. data or do doing the research right now. And they also think the government need to change their law. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so it's a, it's a trade off, right? Um, so if you give too much, then it's a concern about privacy, and but you protect it too much, it's a hamper of uh, the development of, uh, of AI. Since AI is majorly, uh, really needs good data to learn. So um, finding the yeah. right balance, uh, the, the balance point between these actually is a very challenging um, uh, factors. Yeah, so, um, how about FPT? So, do you plan to put AI ethics into uh, FPT's uh, university? Yes, I uh, just mentioned about you know, the, what we're doing. Yeah, I think the, the, the two factors are very important. Uh, AI or even in the uh, society. The first factor is the human. Human is the core and very conscious, and therefore just you raise the cross-conscious issues and AI. Uh, people and conscious, that's very important. If they are uh, good heart, they will do good things. If they have bad mind, they will do bad things. And therefore we have to uh, invest to build the right people with a good heart uh, loving each other, uh, uh, living for values, and so on. That's so important. But anyway, there is uh, people in opposite. And they, he, there, we need the government. We have to have the law, we have to enforcement, we have to do that. Otherwise, as uh, Professor Benjo mentioned, it's unfair. How the economy should uh, go if the, uh, the unfair is not market economy anymore, and therefore very important uh, matters of uh, uh, law and enforcement, and also the kind of the buildings, the uh, kind of uh, cultures and people with the values. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Bing, for your comments. So um, we only have a few more minutes left, so uh, I actually would like one of the audience who are really eager to uh, ask the questions. Um, so uh, we can have only one question for the audience. So uh, can you open your microphone and uh, raise your questions? Uh, hello, good evening everyone. Um, Hello, can you introduce um, yourself and uh, ask your questions? Yes, I'm Tien, and uh, I, right now I am a senior student at the Hanoi University of Science and Technology. 
uh, I study machine learning for uh, about two years. And next year, I want to find an opportunity at an IT company such as SPT Software to learn more about artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning. So uh, could you please share, share more about the career path in uh, AI field in uh, SPT? Thank you. So um, maybe, uh, so for, for this question, so I, I will help uh, the panelists to answer. So uh, for um, AI career, so thanks to the partnership with Mila. So if you are a student still learning AI, um, you can um, learn the, uh, all the program from FPT University. And through this partnership, you can actually access uh, to the um, materials and lectures from Mila. Um, and if you already graduate, uh, you can apply uh, for uh, AI residency program uh, to do research in AI if you are good at the research or if you can join as a production team if you are good at engineer and wants to uh, bring your knowledge into, pro uh, into practical application. Or in further, you can uh, even go to Mila for some ex for the exchange program to visit Professor Joshua and uh, visit <laughs> Frederick in, in Canada um, and uh, bring the knowledge uh, from uh, Mila uh, back to Vietnam. So I hope that uh, answer your questions. Yeah, we have a lot I'd of like opportunities. To add I, I, I'd like to add one thing. Um, if you know you can you can be self-taught you can um read a lot there's a lot of information that is available on the internet for free papers code tutorials talks and if you're motivated you can just go ahead and and sort of try to understand and read a lot um and that's how you're going to become an expert, mostly. Self-learning is a very important part. Yes, yes. Yeah. I add one more comment for the question. This is, uh, last year, I have a chance to visit uh, Mila Institute in Canada, have a chance to have the lunch with uh, Professor Rousseau. And, um, I understand how the Milas uh, cooperate with other uh, university, and I see thousands of master and doctorate uh, go with Milas and do the fundamental research. Very interesting. And I dream that uh, more and more people from Vietnam and ASEAN country can come there. And uh, thank you for two years of cooperation between uh, FPT and Mila. And uh, please come to Vietnam. Thousand, thousand of people, young people here are waiting for you. And uh, we uh, want to build the uh, AI's uh, valleys in Pyongyang. So please, uh, and Frederick, please come to Vietnam and join us to build the valley AI in ASEAN country. Thank you. I also would, uh, would like to add that uh, 5,000 young people watching for our programs. Excellent. Yeah, today, uh, the channel attracted more than 5,000 people registered and watching right now. Uh, so um, we can see that there's a lot of uh, young people are very eager and very enthusiastic uh, to learn more about the advanced knowledge of AI, how AI can change our future. Um, unfortunately, uh, today's uh, time is already up. And uh, thank you very much uh, for the panelists, for Professor Joshua Benjo, Professor Ho Tu Bao, uh, Dr. Chung Zha Bing, and uh, Ms. Judy Tang Ha for joining us today um, and uh, have a great discussions on the potential of, of AI, uh, the, the power and the responsibility of AI when we are using this, te uh, this technology to advance our life in the future. Thank you very much, everyone, again. I hope Professor Joshua Benjo will have a great day today uh, since it's morning time in Canada. 
and uh, have you. a good night for everyone in Vietnam who uh, is already uh, almost 10 p.m. over here. And uh, thank you, Professor Ho Tu Bao, uh, for joining us. Again, see you again. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you very much.